Hi there, and welcome to this tutorial for motion matching for Unity. In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at the event system and what events can do for us. So what are events? Basically, events are any animation actions that we want to trigger explicitly, maybe from an input key press, or in the case of this demo, the vaulting system automatically detecting geometry to vault over. So in this demo, this jump is an event, this jump down is event, these sort of climbing animations are event. Now these vaulting events are relatively complex because they are using animation warping, which is part of the event system, to allow you to have contacts with the geometry. So no matter how high the box is, it still contacts correctly. Now this is just part one of the event uh, tutorial, so we're not going to really be visiting contacts. We're just going to figure out how we can set up events so we can play them. Um, and one example is if I press space, we get a jump. So that is one event that we just trigger. We're not matching any contacts or anything like that. It's just playing the animation. So let's give our robot Kyle a sword attack. Uh, even though we don't have a combat stance, it'll be a good example. So let's close this down and let's have a look at creating events. Okay, to set up events, we first need to go to our preprocessor and we can close down all this because it's not needed and we only need to look at our composites. This is where all, is where all events are going to live. Now we can create a new category and I'm gonna call this sword attacks. And we're gonna set up a sword attack. So let's find an animation that's a sword attack and I think I'm gonna go with this one. It's uh, an Achilles attack from the movie Troy. Um, and that's part of Kubold's clips if you have those specific ones that are the sword Anim set pro, sword and shield anim set, anim set pro. And I'll grab those, that one, and we'll just drag and drop it in just like we would a normal composite. Now the difference is in the settings. So let's have a look at the settings. Now, actually it's taken on the default from the previous one, so I don't want it to be favor tagged at all, but I do want to have it as do not use. I do not, for events, you do not want to use the animation poses in continuous motion. You only want to use them when you explicitly trigger an event. And that's really important that we mark all our event animations as do not use. If we're using mocap and we have event animations somewhere within the take, you would use the um, tag tracks to mark out those as do not use. You don't want to be running around and then suddenly your character attacks for no reason. That's a big problem. So I'm just going to set this up as normal. I'm going to keep flatten and extrapolate just so we get a nice future and past trajectory for it. And now we're done pretty much with this part of it. The next thing we need to do is actually add the event to the animation. To do that, I'm going to get my scene view out and let's hit preview. And we can see our character here. That is our attack. Now, when you're not matching any contacts in a sword attack like this, you it's pretty arbitrary where you put the event. However, as best practice, I like to put it at the point where the sword is going to hit the enemy, if there was an enemy standing there. And at that point, is it's, it's about there. So once I've got it to my point, I'm going to click this little button here to add an event. If I click on the event to select it, I get some additional information. You can see these whiskers here. Um, which define the bounds of the event, and we can also see a lot of data here. Now, events aren't restricted to simply playing an animation. That would be way too simplistic and not fluid enough for motion matching. That's an old way of thinking with state machines. With motion matching, we can, oops, we can jump to any point in any animation, so why don't we take advantage of that with events as well? Now, we can also just trigger an event and let the system decide which is best. Say you're running and you have a right foot forward, maybe you want to trigger a different attack than if you have a left foot forward. But you can just still give them the same event, you can still trigger the same event and let the system decide which one it is. So let's go into these settings. Now the first thing is the event ID and if we click the drop down box we can see all of these event IDs. Now of course I already set these up for the demo scene and if we go to our preprocessor, we can find these IDs under tags and events, event IDs. Now I actually already added the heavy attack 
Um, but let's just say it wasn't there. I'll delete it. We just create a new event ID and call it heavy attack. If you had light attacks, you could create light attacks. If you want to be really explicit with your attacks, you could say heavy attack one, heavy attack two. And if you don't want to say trust the motion matching to fluidly string together combos, that's fine. I've done it in both ways. Um, and sometimes it just depends on your animation, how that works. Um, so here's my heavy attack. And now I go back to my timeline. I can choose, oh, actually I didn't press enter, heavy attack. There we go. Now if I click on my event, I can choose heavy attack. So this ID event now has an ID of heavy attack. So when I'm coding, I know that I can trigger the heavy attack event and it, the system will know that this is that event. So let's have a look. Now we need to define the bounds of the animation. And as I said before, we don't want it to necessarily be the whole clip, especially if we're using mocap data, we don't have that luxury. We need to define a section of the clip that we want it to play. So what do all these different sections mean? Uh, these blue, green, red, and yellow. Now these actually correspond to these fields here. And you can see we have four different stages of an event, the wind up, the action, the follow through and recovery. Now I've de designed this to be relatively intuitive to the way that humans actually move. If we swing our sword, there's multiple stages to that action. There's first, there's the wind up. The wind up is, you know, you twisting back to, um, see like this part, he's sort of twisting, putting his arm back or something. He's getting into position to wind up to, so that he can release the energy. The next is the action. He's doing the action. The next point is the actual event. This is where the action, the result of the action, the hit, the attack. Then we have a follow through this red section. You know, there's always momentum after your action. And then after that follow through, there's a recovery stage where we go back to our normal pose. So it's really intuitive in the way that humans actually move like this. So let's define these sections. Now it's good to start from the middle and go out. So let's start with our action. And basically in our action stage, we want to define what is the compulsory part of this animation that has to play for it to make sense. Now it wouldn't make sense to start the animation here. How did he get up in the air? It would make sense to start from maybe here or even further back. You could start here, but I'm going to actually say, you know, we could, we could actually say that it's compulsory from here. There's no backing out from this point. And I click on this little, line next to action and it'll automatically put it there. You could set the numbers yourself, but that can be quite difficult. Now the next we'll look at the wind up. So what's a wind up? You could say it's from the very beginning to the point where he gets into here, but I'm going to say it's more like uh, anywhere around there. Now it's up to you where you define these points. It's, you know, sometimes it could be up to an animator. It's probably an animator skill, but either way, um, Basically, this wind up period is fluid The the motion matching system is actually going to look at all the poses within this wind up section and say, hey, what which one is the closest to my current pose so that it can match as fluidly as possible into this event without having a big blend or or a sudden snap. It's going to take the closest one to minimize the amount of blending. So if you were making a action game and you wanted things really snappy, you would probably just take the wind up and hit zero because you always want it to start at the same place. You want it to take the same amount of time. In this particular case, let's go for a bit of realism uh, instead and let the system pick the closest pose within that section. I think this is this first part's rather unnecessary. Uh, maybe, maybe there. Okay, so let's now look at the follow through. Now the follow through is very similar to the action in the way that it's also compulsory. You, you physically can't stop yourself from the momentum of the follow through. So you can see from here, he's attacked and he's got to come down and he's stopping himself from moving forward. And I'd say it actually ends about here. That's the follow through. So let's set the follow through to there. And then the last bit is the recovery. He's stepping back into his initial pose. Now, just like the wind up, the recovery isn't necessarily also compulsory, depending on how you trigger the animation. I'm going to say it's from about here to about there. 
it is, we don't need to go all the way to the end because we could just blend into our pose um, about here. But we can also tell the system, hey, if the character, if the player is pushing on the stick to move, that you can actually exit this event before this recovery finishes. You can exit any time in this recovery if the player is pushing on the stick. And this is a specific setting when calling the events, and I'll show you that soon. So now we have set up this attack animation. We're pretty much done with it. We're not going to worry about the contacts. That is for another tutorial um, where we actually match them. But since we're not going to actually match an animation warp, we don't need to worry about the contacts at all. So we can go ahead and pre-process our animation data just like we normally do. Okay, so we've set up our event and its whiskers and its, you know, its, its boundings. How do we now trigger that event in gameplay? Well, it's with a little bit of code and to simplify that code, I've made another asset that helps us define the settings for each event that we want to trigger so that we don't have to do that all in code. Events can become very complex when you have multiple contacts that you want to match and you need to change those settings. In this case, it's going to be relatively simple, but we will do that right here. So we can see we've actually got a lot of these event definitions in the demo scene data folder. And to create those, we just right click on the project view, create MXM core modules event definition. I'm going to call this event definition event def underscore heavy attack. Now we have our event definition asset and there's a whole lot of data that we can um, specify. Now at the top it says event ID. Now we set the event ID to heavy attack down here, but we're just seeing zero. Now the reason is because this is just some random file in our project. It doesn't know um, what our MXM animator is, so it can't really give us the names. So to solve this, we drag our MXM animator in here and it changes to a drop down and we can choose heavy attack. Obviously, you could have multiple MXM animators in your project, so you need to drag in the right one. So we're just going to leave event type as standard. We'll go through other ones in different tutorials. Priority we'll leave as negative one. Number of contacts to match. We're not doing any contact work here. So I'm just going to leave that at zero. Number of contacts to warp. We're not going to warp any contacts this time, so I'll leave it at zero. Now we have exit with motion. Again, this is what I said when your player is pushing on the stick during this follow through section, if we check exit with motion, it will permit the animation to transition straight back to our locomotion, our general motion matching. Um, and it will try and match it. It'll again, it will match from the event to the closest pose in our animation database that matches the pose and trajectory. So there's another win with motion matching at the end of our event here as well. We want to match pose because we've been talking about that. And we don't necessarily need to match trajectory here. Pose will probably be fine because we only have this one big Achilles attack. If we want to match trajectory, that would be good for something like jumps where you have a standing jump, a walking jump, and a running jump. You would match the trajectory so the system could automatically figure out which one to do based on how fast you're moving. So that's um, just be aware that that's there. Post event trajectory mode, I'm going to leave this as is, and we can just close down all these. We don't need any warping whatsoever. We don't want any warping. We're just triggering an animation. So that's our event definition set up with the basics. How do we now trigger that in the code? So let's go to Robot Carl, and we'll look at its example demo input script. And we can actually see I've slotted in a few event definitions here for jumping and sliding. We're just going to add another one of those, slot it in, and then trigger the event. It's really simple once you have uh, created that asset. When I originally created, it was a, about 20 different uh, functions, um, each with a different number of variables based on how complex the event was. Now we just call one function. So let's have a look at that. We've got our event definitions up here. Let's just create a new one that we can access in the inspector. Make some event definition and we'll say m underscore heavy attack definition equals null. And now we can go to our update and let's pick a random key just for testing. Input.get key down, let's say key code dot k. Weird game. It does attacks when you press k for some reason. 
Um, and now it's really simple. We take our MXM animator, which I already have the component for, and I can call a function begin event. And all I do is pass in my uh, heavy attack definition. That is it, one line. And because we have that asset, we can just pass that asset into the begin event instead of having 20 parameters. Okay, let's go back to our project. And there's one thing we need to do before we trigger this. Um, we can see in our inspector, our heavy attack definition has showed up. We need to drag that in. And now if we hit play, we should be able to trigger it by pressing K. So I hit K, we do our Achilles attack. Obviously it looks a bit jarring because you're supposed to be in a combat stance. You would actually set up a combat locomotion set and you would match between that. But this is just an example for the demo. Now notice how the recovery plays until it's finished. However, if I'm running and I hit K and I keep running, it's just gonna match out straight away because we've got that exit with motion going. Now obviously, again, we wouldn't chuck in this random attack animation with this running style, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but if you were using a um, combat locomotion stance, it would probably match much more smoothly. So that is the basics of events. Now this is a really important tutorial because it's the foundation of events, which is all the parkour stuff. We're going to learn more about contacts. We're going to learn about having multiple contacts so that we can get flush hand placements on objects and flush foot placements when we drop down um, and, and all of that. We're also going to look at all the different things we can do. So it's not just position. So matching the foot to the feet land on the point and same with down here. But if we look at these big boxes, if I run at one of these boxes at an angle instead of straight, it warps the angle as well so that when I get to the top, it's um, actually, you know, the right angle instead of trying to climb up sideways and all that. So look forward to that. There's probably going to be three, maybe even four paths to events because we've also got looping events and, and stuff like that that we can get into. So events are extremely powerful. I hope you have learned something about events and I hope this helps you do a little bit more with motion matching. Stay tuned for a lot more tutorials to come. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.